Find the Wonder, that's our theme for, for Advent this, uh, this year. And uh, I was reading in Psalms the other day and I came across Psalm 17, seven, where David said, show me the wonders of your great love. I wonder if that's what inspired the verse in the, in the song, Joy to the World. And the Christian faith, dear ones, is filled with wonders. Magnificent things that once you see them, you're, you're in awe. But why do we say find the wonder? Well, the problem is with us humans, and nod your head if you agree with me. The problem with us is we lose the wonder. We get used to things. We get bored. Sin crops up, and, and, and suddenly the awe is, is gone. Once, once Apollo 11 landed on the moon, the TV ratings of subsequent space missions all plummeted. Well, we'd been there, done that, been to the moon, got some rocks, you know. The same thing happened with the space shuttle. The early missions of the space shuttle were watched by millions. And then, you know, as it became commonplace, it was ho-hum. And so to say to our hearts this Advent, find the wonder, is a way of saying, hey, let's not forget this. Let's do everything we can not to take for granted this great faith of ours. I watched a, an episode of The Crown recently. How many of you watched the, any of The Crown? Great Magnificent production about uh, the royal family. But uh, in this episode, uh, Prince Philip was the queen's husband, and, and they, de they depict him as a religious cynic, largely, uh, in, the, in the series. Well, he's talking to his mother. He's been estranged from her for years, and, and he meets her, and, and he's having this great conversation at the end. She's become a nun, and she shares with Prince Philip uh, about her faith, and she says, you need to consider this. Faith helps, she said, and then there was a pregnant pause, and then she looked in, in Philip's eyes, and she said, no, faith is everything. Faith is everything. And that's what the gospel writer wants us to understand here this morning, and so you have your Bibles open up to Luke chapter 1. Luke is, a, Luke is a masterful writer, and in the first few verses of the gospel here, he tells us why he's writing the gospel. Just check it out, the first four verses of Luke's gospel. And we will be in Luke's chapter 1 and 2 during this Advent, uh, these Advent weeks, so you may want to do a deeper study of, of those two chapters. But here's how he starts. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. He's referring to the story of Jesus. Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. So here's Luke, who is, uh, anybody know what he did for a job? He was a doctor, a physician, that's fun fact number one about about Luke, and he was also a frequent traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. He went with him on some of his missionary journeys. That's fun fact number two. Uh, Luke writes this for uh, this dignitary named Theophilus, which is a word that means friend of God. We're not sure who he was, but the way Luke speaks of him, obviously uh, a noble person of some kind. Or it may be that Luke, and, so, and many think this, that Luke is using a sort of code language here because he's writing to all the friends of God. And, and he's writing to you and me. And why does he say he, want us, he wants to write this? That we might have certainty in the things we've been taught. Luke writes this, these stories so that we find the wonder if I can put it that way. So Luke, being a man of science as well as a man of faith, and you can be both, brings to the table great attention to detail, and he wants to lay out here as compelling a case he can as to why Jesus Christ is everything. And so in these first two chapters, he lays out the miraculous nature of Christ's birth. Christian, Christian apologist Josh McDowell, who's the father of Sean McDowell that many of you have heard of, but he's following, Sean is following in his father Josh's footsteps. And, and Josh McDowell once said, if God were to come to earth as a human, then the events surrounding his coming would be far from ordinary. And indeed they are, as Luke makes, makes clear. So what Luke does in these first two chapters is he builds his narrative around four separate stories, and each one, interestingly, ends in a song. Luke's a good writer. He appreciates art. I think he'd agree with my motto, faith without art is dead. And, and Christmas, 
Come on, it's always been connected with music, with songs. I can't think of a time of year that has better music. Hmm? Chipmunks Christmas album, anyone? Still one of the finest. Everybody and their mother-in-law has a Christmas album. And you could just act as Nick and, uh, and Alyssa, because both their mother-in-laws are with them this week, and I'll bet you they've got a Christmas album. But Luke started it. Everybody in Luke breaks into a song at some point. It's a musical. And these four songs are going to become the hooks on which we'll, we'll place our teaching this, this month. So let's get into story number one, song number one. And interestingly, Luke doesn't begin with the story of Jesus' birth, but with somebody else's miraculous, miraculous birth, the birth of John the Baptist, whom God raises up, as many of you know, to be Jesus' forerunner. John is the one who's going to announce to Israel that their Messiah has come. And it's with John, and especially with his, his father, a man named Zechariah, that Luke is interested in first. Now, it's an interesting story. We won't read the whole thing. It's throughout most of chapter 1. Let me give you the Cliff Notes version, or the Clifton Notes version of it. Zechariah is married to a woman named Elizabeth. Luke says they're both righteous and blameless before God. He says that in verse 6. In other words, these are good people. Luke's not talking in a salvation sense here. Luke knows the gospel. He's with Paul. He knows we're not saved by our goodness, but by Christ's goodness. But if you take salvation out of the mix, we can say that there are genuinely good people in this world, people whose aim in life is to pursue goodness, just as we can say there are genuinely evil people in this world who could care less about goodness. And we're going to meet a lot of good people in, in Luke's Christmas story that God uses, which is a reminder, just because goodness doesn't save you doesn't mean there's no benefit to it, because God is always watching us. Now, one other thing Luke wants us to know, Zechariah and Elizabeth have no children and no prospect of having any because they are advanced in years, Luke says. They're past the years where, where they can have kids. And that should remind us, if you know the Old Testament, of another couple early, early on in the Bible who were old in years and didn't have kids. Who's that? Abraham and Sarah. Way back at the beginning of Israel's story, before there even was an Israel. Well, with this setup, the story that unfolds, Zechariah is a priest, and he's selected to go in the temple one day to offer incense during the time of prayer. And while Zechariah is doing this, and one of the commentaries I read said that there were so many priests in the land back then that for most priests, they'd only get one chance in their whole life to do this. And so for Zechariah, this is a very special moment when he can go into the temple and lead in prayer like this. But then the moment becomes even more special when the angel Gabriel appears to him and scares the heebie-jeebies out of him. And the angel tells Zechariah that he and Elizabeth are going to have a son. And he's going to be great before the Lord, and they're to name him John. And, and, and John is not to drink any wine or strong drink during his, during his years. And if you know the Old Testament, that should remind you of something else. This, this, uh, this, this person called a Nazarite, a special person that God raises up to do, to do some unique assignment. And one of the signs of the Nazarite was they weren't to drink any alcohol. Verses 16 and 17 are noteworthy. Look at these now because they powerfully describe what John's mission will be. John, quote, will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. I love these words. And again, if you know your Old Testament... You should know these words. It should remind you of the prophet Malachi, who speaks right at the end of the Old Testament, right before everything fades to black. He speaks about how before the Lord comes and he'll appear suddenly in his temple, God will send a messenger who will come as Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And I love these words describing John's mission statement. For isn't this what we're supposed to do? 
as we tell other people about, about Jesus, as we invite uh, others to, to, to come to church and share in what we have, aren't we to share a message that brings healing to families? Healing to those who are struggling with father wounds, we could call them that. Aren't we trying to turn the disobedient to the wisdom of the just? I love that phrase. Aren't we trying to prepare people for the Lord's coming? This is John's way of making disciples, connecting communities, and growing the body of Christ. Well, then Zechariah, hearing this, questions Gabriel. He suggests that he's got the wrong man, and more or less, he asks him for a sign. I would think that seeing an angel appear in front of you would be sign enough. Nod your head if you agree with that, wouldn't it? And, and Gabriel seems to think so, because, because he, he says to him in verse 19, uh, I'm Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you good news. And then Gabriel says to him in so many words, Be because you're not receiving this as good news and you're questioning this, you're doubting me, here's your sign, Zechariah. You're not going to be able to speak now until all these things are fulfilled. And with that, Zechariah is struck mute. So the lesson here is the next time an angel appears before you, you listen and do what he tells you? Yes? Sure enough, Elizabeth, like Abraham's Sarah, becomes pregnant in her old age. And then, fast forward to verse 57, if you're following along in your Bibles. The time came for John to be born. Family and friends gather eight days after he is born for his circumcision, for his dedication. And, and during that time, his name is given. And everybody's wondering, what are Zachariah and Elizabeth going to call him? And Elizabeth says, John. And people are like, not John. No, it wasn't a common name. And then Zechariah writes out on a tablet, his name is John. And with that, his tongue is loosened. And he sings the song that was read for us earlier. This prophecy over his son that begins in verse 68. How's that for a story? Wow. Now, before we examine Zachariah's song, and, and, and we'll do that and finish up with this because he has some important things to say, I want to ask a critical question. Why is Luke beginning his Christmas story with this, this tale? I mean, it's interesting and all that, but what does this have to do with anything? How does that help me, this story, how does this help me find the wonder in Jesus? Because if you don't know the Old Testament, I mean, you're just going to get lost. Priests and incense and Nazarites, oh my. It's, it's a labyrinth. Why doesn't Luke just skip this and, and cut right to the story of Jesus' Jesus' birth? I thought Luke was writing to make my faith certain. That is what Luke's trying to do here. He has included this material precisely because it contributes to our certainty. Knowing this story is going to make our faith stronger. How so? I want you to think of Luke's audience for a moment. He hangs out with the Apostle Paul, who goes and, and preaches the gospel to Gentiles. That's why Luke's writing this gospel. He's writing for the Gentiles. Whereas somebody like Matthew writes largely for a Jewish audience. Most of these Gentiles don't know the Old Testament. So Luke needs to introduce them in some way to these stories. Luke wants them to know. Here's what you got to get, that he's sharing this story, sharing with them about the life and death of resurrection, this story that just doesn't happen out of a vacuum. It, it doesn't, doesn't come out of nowhere. It is a message that connects back to the very beginning of God's dealing with humanity. Back when I was in, uh, in college, and I started college, I, I was on a quest. I had to figure out two things. Number one, is there a true religion? And number two, which one is it? I grew up as a Christian, but that doesn't make Christianity true, does it? My parents were Christian. Does that make Christianity true if your parents are Christian? No. Grew up in a country that was largely founded by Christians. Does that make Christianity true? No. What makes Christianity true? It has to be true. Yes? Well, in my search, as I began to explore these different faiths, I immediately took off the table all the religions that had come along late. The religion that would be true, and I wasn't the first to think this because I'm not that brilliant, 
The religion that would have to be true would have to go, go all the way back. All the way back to the very beginning. God couldn't just show up randomly thousands of years into the human story and go, oh, uh, here I am, and by the way, I'm your maker. No. And so to the Gentiles first hearing the story of Jesus, that might be their thought. This is just like any one of these wacky mystery religions that pops in out of nowhere, the Gentiles could think. And it's got this weird assertion right in the middle of it that God became human and died on a Roman cross. Wait, what? Why does Luke start Jesus' story with these Old Testament references and allusions? It's his way of showing that this gospel, this message he's bringing, connects all the way back to the beginning. That there's a relig this religion called Judaism, whose scriptures go back to the very beginning of, cre of creation, written by a people, the Jews, who have a history with God that goes back thousands of years. And so this story of Jesus flows like a river right out of that spring. It grows like a tree right out of those roots. And knowing this, will strengthen that certainty we have that this is the true religion. Knowing this will help you find the wonder. Maybe you've heard it said, it's a, it's a famous saying, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. Say this, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. Say that. Well, the New Testament is the Old Testament Revealed. Say that. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. It's all one story, and both parts need each other. And here's the thing. The bridge between the two testaments. Guess who it is? John the Baptist. <laughs> Which is why they're working in the room. The kids are paying attention. They're just right there. Which is why the Old Testament ends with a prophecy about John the Baptist, and the New Testament begins with this story about him. Jesus came right out and later on, and he said, you know, Elijah that's to come, that Malachi talked about, that's John. And of those born of women, none is greater than John. But then Jesus said this interesting thing. Those in the kingdom of heaven, the least of them is greater than he. What's up with that? He's trying to say John belongs to the Old Testament. The Spirit hasn't come yet. The kingdom of God isn't growing yet. And he's the bridge that brings us into the New Testament. And here's now where I want to look at Zechariah's song as we wrap up. This prophecy that Zechariah gives of his son. Because in this song he gives three different examples of what we're talking about. Of Old Testament themes that all focus like a laser on Jesus Christ. And, and if you get this, what we're going to talk about in the next few minutes, the wow factor for Jesus will go up exponentially. We're only going to be able to touch on, on three of them, and I mean touch on. Entire sermon series, entire books have been written on these things that we're going to talk about. So write these down as we go. Back to Zechariah's song, verse 68. He says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who saved us. We're going to stop right here. Here's theme number one. That will strengthen the certainty of your faith, that Jesus Christ fulfills all the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. When you realize that all the intricate detail, details of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, that all of those details were foretold by prophets centuries before Jesus was born, that should speak something to your heart. And, and, and we can just jot down, and in the Bible study for this week, I list the following prophecies I'm going to quickly mention. I just write them out. So you want to pick up a copy of the Bible study or download it this week. Centuries before Jesus was born, his birthplace was announced. Micah pointed out that Bethlehem would be where he would be born. His journey to Egypt as a, as a child was prophesied by, by Hosea. That he would come from the tribe of Judah is right there in the book of Genesis. The Messiah would come from the line of King David, the son of Jesse. He would be born miraculously to a virgin. 
Isaiah said that, and Isaiah also told the specific miracles that the Messiah would do. In Isaiah 35, your God will come to you, then the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, the lame will leap like like a deer, the mute tongue shout for joy. Those are the exact miracles that Jesus came and did in fulfillment to a 700-year-old prophecy. The Messiah would be rejected by those he came to save. He would enter Jerusalem on, on a donkey prophesied by Zechariah 400 years. He would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. The Messiah's enemies would gamble for his clothing. David prophesied that in Psalm 22, nine centuries before his birth. The Messiah would be executed alongside common criminals and buried in the tomb of a wealthy man. And the Messiah would rise from the dead. Psalm 16, verse 10. Wow. Wow. I can't explain any of these verses away. I've read these verses for decades, and they still blow me away. These verses confront me when I want to run from God, and they they comfort me when I can't find God. My faith just goes up like skyrockets when I think about this. Josh McDowell in his seminal book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, and and Kristen, if you're, if you're listening, Kristen and I had a conversation recently, and she said, is there a good book I can read for Advent? And I thought about this one, but now I, this would be my recommendation. If you've never read Josh McDowell, his, his, his classic book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, comes in two volumes. This would be a great one to read for Advent. Josh McDowell says this, the probability of one man fulfilling all the Bible's messianic prophecies is the equivalent, get this, the equivalent of covering the state of Texas with silver dollars two feet high. Can you picture it, everybody? State of Texas covered with silver dollars two feet high, up to your knees. And then painting one of the silver dollars red, throwing it out into Texas somewhere, blindfolding a person, having them run out into Texas, reach down randomly, pick up one of the silver dollars, and it's the right one. (laughs) That's what it's like that Jesus fulfills all these specific prophecies. And if, and if these don't move you, if, he's lost, if you've lost the wonder of it, it's time, my friends, to get it back. No other faith, religion, or prophecy, or, or, or religion gives you this. Well, let's move on to Zechariah's song. We could spend a whole sermon series on this one. He's going to show mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Theme number two, that will strengthen the certainty of your faith. Jesus Christ fulfills the picture of salvation that God has painted through Israel in the Old Testament. Zechariah mentions the holy covenant. He mentions Abraham here. And if your faith lately has been like one of those Christmas balloons flat on the lawn, spend some time studying this, and your faith should spring to life in no time. We we said it a week ago that everything God did with Israel, even things they, they did not understand, all of them put together creates a picture of Christ. On the back side, the Old Testament side, it looks like I think I use Maureen as one of an example, like one of her cross stitches. You turn it over and it's just a bunch of knotted thread and you're just like, what's this? But then you look to the New Testament side and you turn it over and guess what? It's a picture of Jesus, plain as day. Here are just some examples, a couple examples. Jesus fulfilled each one of Israel's primary leadership roles. Maybe you've heard this said that Jesus comes to us as our prophet, our priest and king. Say that. Prophet, priest, and king. Jesus is the greatest prophet. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Nobody spoke like him. He's also the greatest priest. He's our great high priest. He came not to offer animal sacrifices for our sin, like every other priest did, but he came to offer himself the perfect lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus Compared to all the kings that ever ruled from the throne of Jerusalem, Jesus is the king of kings. 
No one greater. And his kingdom and his rule will never end. Uh, consider this, Jesus fulfilled each one of Israel's rituals and feasts. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice, fulfilling all the sacrifices that Israel ever offered. Jesus' blood inaugurates the coming of the new covenant prophesied by Jeremiah, arguably the greatest prophecy from one of the greatest prophets in the Bible. And here's one you've probably never heard taught, taught, uh, taught about. Each of Israel's feast days, and they had a number of feasts. When you line them up chronologically, you know what? They paint a, a chronology of salvation. The first feast day is, is Passover. Guess what? Jesus is the Passover lamb who shed blood, causes God's judgment for our sin to, to pass over us. The next feast is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which, which follows Passover, and, and it represents Jesus' sinless life. Fifty days later comes Pentecost, the Feast of First Fruits. And on the Feast of First Fruits, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came on the church, and that day, the first fruits of the gospel were born. 3,000 of them came into the kingdom that day, fulfilling that, that feast. The Feast of the Trumpets is the Feast of the Fall Harvest, when all the work is done, and now it's time to rest and celebrate God's bounty in our lives. And is it not interesting that the return of Christ to the earth is said by Paul to be accompanied by the sound of what? Trumpets. The Day of Atonement then ushers in the great Feast of Tabernacles where the presence of God, tabernacling with his people, is celebrated day after day, which points to that future time when Jesus will be upon the earth, reigning with us, and the presence of God will be with men, says Revelation 21. To the Jews, these feasts were just a, a cluster of knotted threads. They, they were just following the, the farming schedule. But we look at that today, and we can see it as plain as day. It's Jesus. And dear ones, if, the, if those first feasts of the, uh, uh, of the calendar were fulfilled up through Pentecost, and the ones that are left, the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of Tabernacles, if the first three or four were fulfilled, what can you bank on? The rest of it's coming too. You got any shivers going down your spine at all? Or is the... Tryptophan still kicking in. Come on! This is amazing. Speaking of the age of sin being over when Jesus comes and reigns upon this earth, it brings us to the final section of Zechariah's song. Verse 76, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of God, whereby the sunrise shall visit from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Theme number three that will strengthen the certainty of your faith. Jesus Christ fulfills the longing of every human who has ever lived to be delivered from the darkness and death of sin. That Zacharias saw this. That the chain of events that would begin with the birth of his son and this chain of events would lead to the forgiveness of sin and the deliverance from sin, from its darkness and death. It's remarkable that Zacharias sees this when you consider that 99.9% .9 of the people living in his time believed that when the Messiah came, he would come and free them from the Romans and set up a political kingdom. But all along, it was as the New Testament was always teaching that our greatest enemies, they're not Egyptians, they're not Assyrians, they're not Babylonians, they're not Republicans, they're not Democrats, our greatest enemy is sin. The heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. Dear ones, I guarantee you, as you think about those that you had Thanksgiving with, either digitally or, or, or together in person, as you think about your family and your extended family, all those people you connected with, those people that you love so much, but are who are all messed up in their own way, and everybody's family is messed up in some way. Can I get an amen? Huh? Each and every one. 
of these family screw-ups and problems and dysfunctions, beginning with, with yourself, with me, each and every one of these is because of this, is because of the inward bent of our hearts to selfishness and to sin. When you strip away all the trappings of life, this life, the unfolding of history, is profoundly moral. And our biggest problems and our biggest fears and our biggest pains and addictions and failures come down in the end, not to the coronavirus. You think the vaccine's gonna fix all our problems if we don't turn to God? Not at all. All these problems come down in the end to the relationship I have with the God who made me. Sin, refusing to listen to God, refusing to live life His way, always leads to darkness, always leads to death. End of story. And I need forgiveness. And I need atonement. And I need a power greater than myself to come into me and help me to live a new life. And so when John the Baptist grew up and became a man, the first time he laid eyes on Jesus, they didn't grow up and play together as boys, though they were, they were related. The first time he lays eyes on Jesus, you know what he says? Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. John's reminding us that through Christ, I find forgiveness. No other religion can give you this. No other religion can give you atonement. Wipe away your shame and your guilt. Jesus can. His death on the cross. His perfect life traded in for my sinful life. Makes it possible. But I need more than forgiveness. I, I, I need to stop doing the things that need to be forgiven in the first place. Who will give me that help? Oh, guess what? It's Jesus. Who promises me that if I yoke myself to him... And if I learn from him and let him teach me and train me, I can live life in such a way that I can have rest for my souls. But I gotta do life with him. From here on out, this isn't religion, this is a relationship and I need to spend time daily with him if this thing is gonna work. Giving your life to Jesus is easy. Living with Jesus, that's the hard part. Jesus said, if anyone's gonna follow me, you gotta take up your cross daily and follow me. And but it's in the seeking and the following and the serving and the learning that sin's chains loosen and fall off of me. And that's why, dear ones, Christmas is hope for the sinful. Because it all points to him, the Jesus Christ who gives light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. And he guides our feet into peace. Just like Zachariah sang about.